So far, the only trial Trump has faced since leaving office is, of course, the Senate impeachment trial. In the wake of the insurrection at the Capitol, it was supposed to be his day of reckoning. And to be quite clear, Democratic impeachment managers presented a devastating case. They laid out with surgical precision how Trump stoked his supporters into storming Congress. But still, apparently to avoid his wrath, 45 senators chose to lock arms, claiming it was unconstitutional to try Trump after he's left office, and 43 Republican senators then voted to acquit him. Senate Republicans basically let him off scot-free. Now, if he chooses, Trump can run for president again in 2024. But as Congressman Ted Lieu of California, one of the House managers, as he framed it during the closing arguments, it's not Trump's winning that's cause for concern. You know, I'm not afraid of Donald Trump running again in four years. I'm afraid he's going to run again and lose because he can do this again. No U.S. president has ever been convicted after being impeached, despite four attempts in our history. So what's the point of this whole impeachment process if it can't hold a lawless leader to account? Who better to ask than one of the House impeachment managers, Congressman Ted Liu himself of California. Uh, Congressman, thanks for joining us on the show tonight. You're a former prosecutor. You've done a lot of trials prior to this Senate one. In hindsight, what would you have done differently? A lot of people you know are upset that the House managers held a trial without calling witnesses, not a single one. Uh, thank you, Mehdi, for your question. I would have loved to have had witnesses. The issue we, we ran into is that any non-friendly witness would have objected to the subpoena, and then that would have been litigated in federal courts for months, potentially years. We're still litigating the McGahn witness subpoena from the first impeachment, which is why I've introduced legislation to allow the House of Representatives to use an inherent content power to fine witnesses money for disobeying congressional subpoenas. Right, at the end of the day, um, because we haven't executed that power before, I don't think that the Senate was going to go ahead and do that power, so we wouldn't have been able to get these witnesses in that we wanted. So explain to me, Congressman, how that bill you mentioned that would allow Congress to levy penalties against officials who refuse to comply with subpoenas. How would that work in practice? How much money are we talking about here? Because John Bolton or Don McGahn, who refused to turn up at the first impeachment trial, uh, they're pretty wealthy people. Couldn't they just pay a fine and avoid turning up? Uh, that's a great question. So first of all, the Supreme Court has upheld this power for Congress to execute. And last time Congress did it was uh, shortly before World War II. The current legislation I have would authorize a fine of $25,000 increments up to a maximum of $100,000. Now, you're right. Some people would view $100,000 as maybe not that much. For most people, that is an extraordinary amount of money. And so if you're going to ignore a congressional yes. subpoena facing that kind of fine might cause you to think twice. And just one more question on the witness issue, because it's something that bothered me. Viewers of this show will know that I was uh, upset uh, that there were no witnesses in this trial. And I pointed out the inconsistency between last year's trial, where Democrats said there had to be witnesses, this year's trial, where, as you say, the argument was it was too difficult to get witnesses. I understand that in the context of White House aides, Trump advisers, Republican members of Congress. But surely you could have got rioters, attackers who said, we want to testify and say that Trump told us to attack the Capitol. There were, there were people on record saying that. People from the National Guard who were involved in phone calls as to where they were and what the cause of the delays were. Surely you could have got them without threats or fines or subpoenas. Uh, so I don't disagree with you that we could have gotten friendly witnesses. I do know that we did have a huge number of people that we presented in the trial and at at the end of the day, Senate Leader Mitch McConnell said we proved our case, essentially, that they were hanging their hat on this willful misreading of the Constitution, that there somehow was no uh, jurisdiction. Uh, so after the fact, when you read these Senate Republican statements, it became clear to me that basically the only witness we could have called that would have made a difference is if we had resurrected one of the founding fathers and had that person come in and explain there's no January exception to the Constitution. Now, they would have said, James Madison's a socialist. Take him away from here. Um, let no, me ask you this. You impeached Donald Trump twice. <laughs> 
You, you impeached Donald Trump twice, and twice he got off. Uh, has impeachment become a redundant constitutional tool? Surely future Congresses, short future House of Representatives will think twice before bothering to impeach a president, seeing what happened twice to Trump and once to Bill Clinton just in the last, what, 25 odd years? So that's a very interesting question. Uh, no president has ever been convicted uh, of an impeachment. However, this time we did have the most bipartisan impeachment ever out of the House of Representatives. Yes. And then we actually had the most bipartisan conviction ever in the U.S. Senate. In most cases, a vote of 57 to 43 is not close. Impeachment is a very high bar. It's true. And it does sort of show that if you have a party that has a similar number of people in it that of or of this former president's party or the current president's party, it is, in fact, very difficult to get a conviction at impeachment. No, you make a very valid point about the 5743, these kind of artificial uh, counter-majoritarian obstacles that were put in place uh, in the U.S. constitutional system. It's always worth reminding you, you need 60, uh, you needed two-thirds in the Senate in order to get conviction, and you got a clear majority at least. Um, let me ask you this, Congressman. What are your thoughts on Trump's latest legal troubles that we've been reporting on the show today? Do you think any court will convict him of any of these potential crimes, whether it's financial crimes in Manhattan, uh, electoral-related crimes in Georgia, in Fulton County? A former U.S. president, do you think a former U.S. president will ever see the inside of a prison cell? So let's think about how extraordinary Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell's statement after the trial was. He was basically saying the criminal justice system exists to hold Donald Trump accountable. He was basically one step away from saying lock him up. So we now do have prosecutors looking at the facts of these cases. I'm not privy to the specific facts they're looking into, uh, but I do expect them to follow the facts wherever it may lead. And under our system of laws, no one is above the law, not the president, not the former president. And if the, the facts show that the former president violated criminal laws, then I would expect these prosecutors to indict him. And you have, um, as I mentioned, you have the case in Fulton County where the DA is looking into the phone call between Donald Trump and uh, Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger about uh, election interference. You have Cyrus Vance, as we mentioned on the show already, uh, looking into financial crimes and tax fraud. Uh, there's talk of the D.C. Attorney General, perhaps, potentially, or even the Biden DOJ uh, going after Trump on incitement for violence, using some of the evidence that you and your colleagues uh, put together so strikingly uh, not so long ago. Where do you think he's got the most legal exposure, in your view? Uh, that's a great question. And again, I'm not privy to these facts. Uh, however, when you look at what happened in Georgia, um, it appears there is a state law that the president uh, likely violated when he's basically pressuring the Georgia Secretary of State to find 11,780 votes to overturn the election. And then when you look at the investigation in New York, it appears that they're hiring additional personnel to conduct that investigation, which shows me that they're looking at facts that they think is going to lead somewhere. And I think the former president is in legal jeopardy on both the civil and criminal front. And I also want people to remember, Michael Cohen sat in prison um, for committing various crimes Donald Trump was a co-conspirator to some of those crimes. And let's not forget that that happened as well. Indeed. One last question for you. There's been a spate of pretty awful and pretty high profile assaults on Asian Americans, especially uh, in California, your home state. What's driving these attacks? And do we take hate crimes against Asian Americans as seriously as we should? Does the DOJ? Both of those are great questions. I'll answer your first one first. As we show during their impeachment trial, a lot of times violence doesn't just come out like lightning out of the blue. It takes months of fomenting passions and hatred. And you had a president of the United States who would use racist remarks like Kung flu and direct these racist phrases, whipping up passion against the Asian American community. And during a pandemic, we saw hatred rise against community and an increase of violent hate crimes. Unfortunately, that has 
uh, continued because the former president whipped up this hatred and did nothing to try to stop it. Thank goodness we have a current president who doesn't use racist remarks anymore. He actually signed an executive order to tackle uh, hate crimes against Asian Americans and hate crimes in general. And your second question about does the DOJ take it seriously enough? I led a bipartisan letter of 150 members of Congress last term to Bill Barr saying, please do more on hate crimes issues. Uh, he actually ignored that letter. My hope is that the current administration will not, and I do, do expect that Merrick Garland, when he's confirmed, will in fact start looking at hate crimes much more aggressively. We're going to be talking about Merrick Garland uh, in a little moment, but you just reminded me of that haunting, harrowing, horrific images where Donald Trump was at that rally last year and the crowd was shouting Kung Flu, Kung Flu, egging him on. It was kind of pure, oh, I don't know how to describe it, just naked racism uh, on display. And you're right to highlight that. And I hope we all can as a nation push back against that kind of ugly racism. Congressman Ted Liu, uh, appreciate your time tonight. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.